me like a month for this one to arrive from Hong Kong or yep. Taiwan or somewhere. Yeah, I think Taiwan. Okay, I think we're live. Um, yeah. uh, let me just check if we are actually live. Um, I also have it open here. Restream. Let me check. I, uh, um, there we go. We do look live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks like yeah, I can see myself. Oh, my screen is bigger than yours. A bit. Ooh. Wait, okay, now I have to mute yeah. this. Um, there we go. Otherwise, I will confuse myself. Yes, mm -hmm. there's an app actually that um, breaks your speech. It's a it's an app which you put headphones on and speak, and it repeats what you said like less than a second later, completely black out. Like I was trying to talk and my my speech was entering my head as I was talking. It just uh, stop talking. It's weird. Oh yeah, no, no. I've, that's the thing that gets me with Twitch the most here is that when you go live and you hear yourself, there's that lag, and you're like, uh. Yeah, I, 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 I have to mute myself. Let me just open up Twitch as well, and I want to open up YouTube and all the stuffs, <laughs> all the things. Yeah, stream seems to be working on this side. We've got eleven people. Let me just say hello to them quickly. Because I'm not receiving. Uh, okay, okay. So I, 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 I get the chat. That's fine. Um, hello, everybody on the chat. If you are able to see this, yeah, uh, I just sent the message quick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, see that, see that. There's always going to be technical issues, so yeah. Mm. Hello, hello, Dennis. Um, cool. I think oh, we can get slow. We can get started with this, with our plan, if there is such a thing. <laughs> 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 yeah, like we have a script today. Uh -huh. So, um, oh no, yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the second episode or second edition or second stream of uh, of Streaming on the Rocks is the name of this series, apparently, uh, is where my my brother from another mother, Kobus, uh, and myself uh, sit on a Friday evening uh, with a lovely drink in our hands. And we discuss technology, look at some things which are might necessarily not too much work related, but uh, we try to find things to talk about. So uh, last time it was really good. I think um, we had people, uh, we got got a positive feedback about the last episode. So um, I hope we can keep you entertained even today. Uh, so today's plan is kind of to talk about tooling and no, some no. tools. Tooling, tooling, yes. The name of the it's episode, is, it's tooling because this is episode number two and we talk about tooling. So some one of us is a dad apparently, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so Kobus, what's your poison today? Uh, today I'm actually going for a nice white wine. Uh, white it's a local uh, Chardonnay, wooded. Uh, so it's slightly more in the old style. So it's got a nice balance of buttery um, wooden oakiness to it, which is lovely. Uh, some of the more modern Chardonnays don't always have the wood, which I dislike. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I'm 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 a simple man, so I, I just literally took the last uh, last time's drink. I'm again drinking the the Monkey Forty Seven um, Schwarzwald uh, Gin and Tonic. So uh, I am a fan of this drink, and it's a it's a hot day today in Berlin. So it's this is a a, a pretty appetizing drink today. <laughs> nice. Mm. Yeah, we are finally in the middle of winter. We had our first uh, rainstorm this side, uh, so it's uh, it's only thirteen at the moment. So it's okay. you know terrible winter weather. <laughs> We had 27 today, apparently. So it was uh, it was warm, it was humid, so not the best of things in the world. But hey, what can you do? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, cool. Kobus and I were fighting a bit, setting up how can we, uh, well, trying to fight technology today, which is our jobs, I guess. Uh, fighting technology, how can we best stream with the best experience, show you our tooling or our, well, that sounded dirty, um, our tools. Mm, our Linux tools that Worse. we use from the command line. Um, how can we best do that? So uh, let me just switch to the desktop view. Uh, so we're going to be trying to basically use the power of Linux and Tmux or terminal multiplexers to kind of share our screens. So what you're seeing right now is actually my laptop screen. Uh, but later on, once we go ahead and connect to Cobus's uh, virtual machine, uh, we're going to try to do some Tmux magic there as well. So yeah, um, kind of a lot of people ask me uh, since I've been doing these streams, like, hey, Darko, can you talk about how do you set up your terminal? How do you set up your tools? You have a nice looking Vim there. Uh, what are your favorite tools? I did once a stream on AWS tools, but I think I can expand a bit uh, on that today to include some non AWS uh, tooling. Okay, before anybody asks, uh, I am running 
Linux. So this is Linux you see here on the on the screen. It's actually uh, it's running Arch Linux. I run Arch by the way, uh, and um, it's running an i3 window manager. So that's why it's uh, like this. So it's a, it's a tiny window manager with all the things that break your fonts. So yeah, <laughs> so yeah. But uh, I'm spending most of my time on this, and this is actually. Um, Neofetch? Do I have a Neofetch? No. Oh, hey. I want to show off my, my powerful laptop. Um, it's, uh, it's a Lenovo X201. So it's a ThinkPad 201. It's, I think, 10 years old. <laughs> and it has an i5 CPU with a, like, 4 gigs of RAM, which is sufficient for what I'm doing. So... Uh, it's not being streamed from this one. This one cannot handle streaming for to save it last, to save its life. So, streaming is done from the actual big boy desktop over here. So, the yeah, new uh, desktop, a new desktop, exactly. So, desktop mm. is also running uh, Linux, but not when I stream because streaming from Arch, I I I've, I struggle with OBS there and my camera and all the stuff. Mm. So I have Windows for that. Um, cool. So yeah. where should I start? Um, well, I suppose we should SSH into the instance and get our TMUX set up first because yes. we didn't manage to do that because we ended up setting up an instance and then I broke something and then it was easy yeah. to just spin up a new one. Yeah, so, so. this is how we're going to do it. So Kobus has spun up an instance somewhere in the cloud. I um, access it, so it's an Ubuntu instance running there. And hopefully Tmux LS, there is no Tmux session running on there. So we're gonna use Tmux or Terminal Multiplexer basically to share the same terminal session together. And when you use the Terminal Multiplexer, you basically are able to see each other's session in real time, right? So if I do Tmux like so, and then Kobus types Tmux LS, um, or then he should, you should be able to see my uh, the terminal session. So if you do Tmux attach dash dash session, dash t and then zero you should be able to connect to my uh well to this tmux session and tmux uh attach at attach dash uh, session attach dash, oh, dash. session hello uh, m zero. hello m mensa hello uh jenan sql heidenberg heisenberg hello yo majesty 88 hello everybody oh is a double dash session uh Sorry. no uh it should be Tmux attach attach dash session. So uh, it's a, it's the same thing. So Tmux, uh, you know what? You start a Tmux session. Just start with Tmux session. Well, if, so here's the fun part. I'm a screen person. I'm not a Tmux person. Ah. I'm more than happy to learn. So show me what am I doing wrong? I know so, it's something Tmux attach attach Tmux, session. Tmux attach dash session. All, okay. all the same word. Then mm -hmm. space. Then dash yep. T. Space zero. Okay, dash E as in dash T correct. as in as in uh, T, oh, as T. T as in Trevor. There, uh, go. Ah. there you go. There you go. Cool. See, now you're connected. Cool. Now the nice. session has automatically resized to your viewing size, so you can see mm. that there is. Well, you, maybe you can see it on the stream, but you will see that on the bottom row of my uh, my uh, terminal is basically just lines because it's small. Your session is smaller than mine, apparently. Mm. So uh, now we can basically uh, anything that Kobus writes, you should be able to see here through this. Now using Tmux, and this is one of the tools I used extensively. Uh, uh, using Tmux is a great way to, first of all, uh, collaborate with people on the same set, on the same system. Uh, secondly, I think the most valuable thing about screen and Tmux is the ability to have yeah, no 42 inch screen. <laughs> uh, the most valuable part of Tmux is the ability for it, for the session to just live. Uh, unlike having a a standard terminal window by running a command and then your computer crashes for some reason, a Tmux session will always live the same as screen. Mm. So I never I got mean, into I never got into screen. Screen is something that uh, I've seen. Screen is something the first I've seen, but then somebody showed me Tmux like it's simpler to use and yeah. Mm. I think it's a case of um, when because I know I started using screen way back in 2003 or four I think for the first time so mm. might just be that at that point the people I was working with they were just more mm. into screen than Tmux um, but I mean the important thing here is I think just to clarify that one point is that if you connect to a remote server and you're running a command and your SSH session dies yeah. or you have connectivity issues that command will stop because you lose yes. your session yeah. so that's why 
using TMUX or screen is one of the most important things when you connect to remote servers, especially if you've got bad connectivity. Exactly, exactly. So no matter what you're doing, uh, even like even if you have good connectivity and you want to do something else on the same server, instead of establishing a new SSH server, when you do TMUX or screen, you're not connecting to a new SSH session, you're actually just uh, using the same SSH tunnel uh, to connect, well, just basically launching a new TTY. Uh, so. Oh, cool. Oh, we even have cool. chat. We have chat. Mm. Mm. Excellent. So, Kobus, what do you want to show us? What what's Show us your tools. Okay, cool. Um, so, the first one, let's just quickly make sure if I've got uh, AWS CLI installed. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so, basically, the tools I want to show you is just how to poke around the instance a little bit for when you start troubleshooting. Because one of the things I often see people struggle with is I get you get onto a box and it's like, something is broken and you don't know where to start looking. So we're going to dig into how to see what processes are running, what ports are being used. Um, we're going to take a look at some of the um, instance, like, uh, conf well, not configuration of hardware, how many CPUs and things it has. And also how you can, for example, look at some of the performance metrics. So just see, is the CPU being hit hard or the disk or um, those things. So first thing you want to do is you want to see what are you dealing with. So we're going to go with uname A, which will show you what um, kernel you're running. So in our case, we can see that it's an Ubuntu kernel um, and it was compiled on 12 April at one second past 46 minutes, blah, 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 blah. Um, and this is kernel version 5.4.0. Um, and I think it's patch 1009 and uh, specifically AWS built one. So this is the default, uh, well, not the default, uh, a default Ubuntu image provided by Canonical. So that's, um, and it's compiled with specific kernel flags to make use of some of the hardware on AWS, I believe. How do you get the Ubuntu version from a system like this? What's the fastest um, way to do it? Uh, now I have to remember that is, uh, buh, 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 buh. yes, there we uh, go. Release. It's been a while. There we go. Uh, but um, you have to use uh, asterisk, um, well, release. So it will, it has multiple files. So yeah, this is the <laughs> fastest way to do it. Hello, Gaelic God. Yeah, Screen is God like. Well, this is exactly the same thing like Screen. I don't know the exact differences between Tmux and Screen. Well, I know different commands they use, uh, but uh, they get the same thing done in essence. So the only problem I have with Tmux um, is they change features so often. So I've been using Tmux for the past four, five years, right? And I've had to constantly adapt my dot files depending on which version they run all of a sudden they stop supporting one flag completely change something else it just doesn't work right so <laughs> and and there's a thing like i if i install tmux on amazon linux and this is using tmux um i think which one is this 3.80a so uh, recently it was using 2. Point something and my dot files from my laptop wouldn't work here or if i run debian that has an older version so Tmux is a bit problematic when you um, when it comes to features and you have a pimped out uh, configuration file. So, <laughs> um, so please continue. I'm sorry, I, I broke your train okay. of thought. No worries. Um, then next thing I want to show is there's this metadata API um, running on all uh, EC2 instances that a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy in a couple of commands, set some environment variables, and then pull out some details about the instance. So you can see there is just the tag name that I'm going to search for is the name tag on the instance. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the instance ID. And what you can do is you see this HTTP endpoint there. If I just run uh, wget on it as is, what you can see is I can get a value over there. And there's a whole bunch of information, like for example, the uh, region that you're running in, the availability zone that you're running in, what IAM role are you using, et cetera. So you can get quite a lot of info about your running instance from this um, HTTP endpoint. And it's running on the instance itself. It's only accessible by that instance. So you don't have to worry about someone else from the outside reading details from that instance. Uh, then what we have to do is the second variable we have to get is the region. So let's pop that in here. Uh, oh, it would help if I actually copy and pasted the whole... Oh, no, I did run it. Okay, cool. Let's just double check that I've got the right values. And cool, I've got the instance ID and the region. And now for the fun part is I can go find out what this instance name is. And in case you're wondering, yes, you can use emojis inside the yes. tags inside AWS. So it's it's quite quite fun. 
So by the way, my terminal up until recently would crash if it was showing an emoji. So this would be super fun Ooh. if if <laughs> if you would show That's an emoji. Good to know right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, fun, fun, fun. Okay, so now we are on the system. Now we need to start figuring out, okay, what is actually running on it. Now, for those not familiar with PS, that's uh, it lists all the um, uh, things running on the machine at the moment. And if you look at it, this will give you the... Oh, sorry, your scroll is a bit weird, so I'm not going to scroll again. Um, so the first column is like uh, the process ID that gives you... Um, uh, the idea of the process, you can then interact with it if you want to, for example, kill it or um, just get some info out of it. Um, and then on the right, you can actually see what the command is. Now, this is useful to a certain extent, but if you use a slightly pimped version of this, um, you can get a very interesting graph mm -hmm. like this. Oh, sorry, or tree view rather. Okay. So what you can see up here, if you look at the... By the way, if you want, if you want, if you want to scroll, Control B, mm -hmm. uh, okay. square bracket. Oh, so it's the same by... Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's break and then uh, cut mode or copy mode. Yeah, it's the same yeah. as in screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, let's do that right now. I'm not sure if that's going to show up on, 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 on this end, but try it out. Uh, I just want to see if this will show up. Um, because nope. maybe it's just scrolling through the buffer on, on my side. I don't know. But I can scroll if you, if you need me to scroll. Okay, so I think I'm um, just to highlight that if you look at, let me just do that uh, one more. Let me see. Okay, yeah. Now what we can see there is, so you can see this little tree view. So you can see, for example, there's one SSH session that was running um, Bash and it did something. Uh, I created a new group with Docker and then also attached a Tmux session. Uh, we can see that there's another ses SSH session running with Bash. There's another session running with Tmux. Now the reason there's two this is all well, three ssh session sessions here is that i actually am logged in with my home machine as well so let me quickly log out uh let me just get to that one quickly give me a second uh there we go and if i now run this again we can see that there's only our two ssh sessions that uh, that are running at the moment you can see that we both get uh, attached to tmux in the end so this is how you can see a nice view of what things are linked and where it becomes even more fun is if you do things like with Docker. So let's quickly run a Docker container that's just going to do a CPU stress test mm -hmm. and then run this again. And now what you can see is actually the Docker um, D using container D and that's actually then calling that binary stressed ng inside the container and we're running four copies of it because we specified four threads. Yeah. So this is a, a first step just to see what is actually running on this machine. So while that is running, uh, did I set it to 90 seconds? We might be able to still catch it. Let's see. Okay, ah. well, yeah, it's still running. Yeah, so the next utility that's super useful is HTOP or just yes. top. So HTOP is a slightly pumped out version of the normal top, which we'll also show. So you can see CPU usage, same process um, working. You can uh, ask it to do the same tree view like you had before. Um, and you can see over here, it should probably die out in how many, 90 seconds. Eh, how many seconds more? Probably a few more seconds. And then we'll see the CPU actually go down. Because I specified four, um, the containers are running single threaded at the moment, which means that we're using four of the eight CPUs. Uh, we just spun up a, what's it, a T3 large or double XL? I can't remember. Just something with a bit of juice so we can play around a little bit and see things like the CPU information. Um, By the way, uh, chat, is my voice or my sound okay? Last time I did my stream, it was super quiet. So I just want to make sure that it's loud enough and that the music is not too loud can somebody just confirm let us see this is now the fun you have to wait that seven seconds seven seconds ten yeah. people it all goes dunk, de -dunk. <laughs> thank you dennis thank you uh cool. cool awesome okay um now we can actually see that that process is finished so we can see that the cpus are now idling again basically so just for those who want to know what the normal top looks like it looks like this um muscle memory i can't remember what it is for but if you hit um uh, z and x you can get it into red and can show you which column is currently the sort in descending order you can see that it's on actually let me just check on the stream can you see that uh no we can't so Oh, that's interesting. It could it could be a limitation of Tmux. So Tmux by default doesn't have any colors. I've enabled uh, 256 colors on this one. Mm -hmm. So it could be a combination of my terminal plus um, Tmux. You never know. So yeah. So actually, what 
I want to say I can see that the CPU column is slightly more red, but um, that's something we'll do for next time. But what you can do then is to use the shift and the little, I don't know what you call these angled brackets, the ones Square at the bottom. Brackets. No, no, oh, no, no, the ones uh, less, comma, less, less oh. than or greater than. Okay, so you can use those two then to sort by different columns. So you can take a look at the mem total memory, total CPU, um, and all the other values or sort by them at least. Um, the other one useful one you can see here is the load average that you get. You get the uh, five minutes, wait, wait, it's the one minute, five minute, and 15 minute, 15 minute load, average. load average. Yeah. And how this works is that depending on how many cores you have, um, that'll give you an indication of is this a good or a bad number. So in our case, we've got eight cores. So if you see this value go above eight, it means that we've got more than eight um, uh, CPUs maxed out any, at any given time, kind of. It's, it's a little bit more intricate than that, but I don't want to go into too much detail. But basically, what, however many cores you have, if it's number, higher than that, then you know your thing is being stressed and it's slightly busy. Yeah. So if we do, for example, let's quickly run the Docker command again. Just show you. Uh, your majesty, just it's not angle brackets. It's um, greater than, lesser than. So it's the, the, the ones, right? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, and I forgot to actually write that. Is, is it visible, no. Venice, on the stream? I, I really cannot see that. Like, I am... It might be my my crappy forty three inch screen, uh, but it also can be. Uh, yeah. Is it on the memory now or is it CPU? Uh, oh, it's on no, the CPU. No, it's on CPU. CPU. Yeah. So the column of CPU might be slightly darker. It just okay. Doesn't show up on my side that that nicely. Yeah. Nah, I'll trust you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So what we can see over here now is that the load average is starting to go up because obviously we've got four of the eight CPUs being pegged um, at hundred um, percent, and it is. Ah, so we've got, have we got hyper-threading on these machines? That'll be a very interesting question. Mm. Uh, proc CPU info, let's see quickly what we've got. Um, we I go. have to remember how to, ooh. I'll go back, I'll go remember. back, I'll go back. Uh, okay. Yeah. Control B, or actually, am I clicked here? Yes, I am. Control B, it doesn't work. Oh, Control B doesn't work. Oh. So... Is it? So, we do have as this, uh, uh, but it's CPU cores. Yeah, we have CPU cores for um, yeah, we have CPU cores for double check. Sorry, this is where you get too much info about your system, mm -hmm. about your processor. So, yeah. well, it has it has uh four cores and if we look at h top so if you go here and, and just um h top we see eight cores so it has hyper mm. okay so then i'll have to go double check exactly what that load means because i was expecting it to pop up to four uh, to four not to two um but that could be because of hyper up it's been a while since i've had to dig into that um Let's see if someone in the chat is correcting us. No, not yet. Not yet. Hopefully no, someone will. No. We can learn as well from it. People okay. have people have stopped stopped caring about load averages, right? This is the this is the <laughs> era of, of, of super high performance cloud computing. What is load yeah, average? Yeah, it's it is kind of like spin up another machine or spin up something bigger yeah. kind of happens. <laughs> exactly. Um yeah, I actually took what was it, a C five N eighteen XL for a spin yesterday because I had to do parallel uh, well, just a test on parallel um, S3 uploads. So okay. I thought, well, you know, go for something nice and big. It had uh, 48 cores, I think. Mm -hmm. It was quite fun. Quite nice to play with. Um, okay. okay, so now, by the way, for those not familiar, if you um, look in this uh, folder prompt, you can get quite a lot of info. So, for example, um, if I quickly look at what our process uh, ID is, where's my dollar? There we go. So we are running on... 10,889. So I can go cat proc because everything on Linux ends up being a file in the end. Yeah. You can actually see a lot of info about our process. If I just go Alice over here, we can see a lot of different things. And I can go, for example, if I cat uh, the environ, I can see all the environment variables that we currently have set inside our session as well for our process. So there's yeah. quite a lot. And this is one of the reasons where if you are running as root on a machine, and you're running any kind of system or process that actually pulls some environment variables to use, for example, database passwords and things, that the root person can see that. Yeah. So that's why you always tell, try and convince people don't use environment variables for those kind of things, build it into your app so it actually pulls it and then use it in memory. Ultimately, obviously, as a root user, you can actually go and dump the memory and still get at it, but it's at least yeah. a lot 
hotter than just you know environment variable grab and go absolutely absolutely no. environment variables are, are a tricky thing especially if you want to store sensitive information such as database passwords and, and access keys so those things are I know people advise that you do sometimes in like even some tools like oh just put it in an environment variable yeah mm. be careful <laughs> well be careful if you don't know who's got root on the machine because exactly. obviously by the time you've got root access uh, you might have other problems exactly so <laughs> yeah <laughs> So this tells us a little bit about what processes are running and all that. And then one of the other fun ones that people tend to hit is a, I can't use a port or something's listening on the machine. What else is there? Uh -huh. So for that, we've got Netstat. That's um, that. I use T-U-L-P. I'm not sure which one you do use. I use T-U-L-P, T-U-L-P-N or Tulip for in my, in my, in my head. So Maya is L-N-T-P. L-N-T-P. So, okay. Close. <laughs> so it's for listening. Um, on numbered ports, TCP, and I can't remember what the P is for. That's kind of how I process. remember. But... It's a process name. Okay. So what's the N then? The... Or, or, or the P is a PID or port? I don't know. Oh, let's quickly do them. Uh, just see what nets that. Oh, uh, man, nets that. So other one is man is for manual, and you can actually see any commands um, configuration file. So what you can see over here, T is for TCP, uh, and we had L for listening ports, N is for the numeric port number, um, and then P is also list the program. So we can see the port number as a numeric value on TCP okay, that's yeah. listening. Cool, okay, that makes a little bit more sense, cool. Uh, other fun one is control R, so you yes. can reverse search for um, commands that you issued. So let's say I, in this case, issued nest that if I press control R a second time after telling in, uh, typing in E, it'll go one up again in terms of what it finds. So now I can just reuse that command. So what this tells us is that for TCP, and you can see the difference between uh, IPv4 and 6, that on um, the first one is 127.0.0.53. We're listening on port 53, and that's actually a mechanism inside AWS that we use to expose DNS for the instances. So they can make a DNS request to localhost, and then from there, we do some fun things depending on what your configuration is like. Um, the second important one is SSH that we're using because um, we need to be able to get to the box. So you can see that SSH is listening on this funky IP called 0000, which means that if you've got multiple network um, interfaces, it'll actually allow you to connect on any one of those IPs. So when you are binding things to a specific port, normally you bind to all IPs, but you can actually have multiple network adapters and have, let's say, one process running on port 80 on adapter 1 and port 80 on adapter 2 for a different process should you want to. Um, and then lastly, you can see TCP um, v6 is also enabled and we are listening for SSH on that. So now if I go for something like uh, Docker run detach, uh, let's just do engine X, I think by default just starts up. We don't have to do anything funky there. So Engine X is just a little web server for those not familiar with it, and it automatically binds to. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <didn't have> <laughs> <intended. Yes. laughs> so super useful a little web server. It's often actually also uses a reverse proxy for modern systems because you can easily reload configs as your infrastructure and services that are running change, and then it, it's able to route requests to them, which is useful. So now uh, let's just make sure that it's actually running. It is running. Uh, and you can see over there that, it, that it's binded to port 80. Uh, I didn't specify the Docker command to do host networking. So let's quickly see what our netstat says again. Um, there we go. So the reason is that I didn't specify it to bind to anything. To bind, so yeah. we have to do that. Uh, yeah. Docker stop. Uh, oh, I didn't give it a name either. Okay. Let's do this properly. Uh, okay. Docker uh, RM. Get rid of that one. Docker run. Uh, detached mode, uh, dash dash name, engine, engine X, dash dash network. Uh, I'm going to specify host mode uh, because I wanted to use the host networking stack so it'll board, bind automatically to port 80. Uh, and I think this name I need to also be equal to. Is that the syntax? No, it's no, space. Just like space, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since I've had to run this by hand as well. Use ease. Buck run at least one argument. Oh. I need to tell it what to run. That would help. <laughs> cool. Hello, hello, D Andre. Is it D or D the A Andre? We got a heart. We got a heart yeah. in our chat. I'm not sure if this is hard because of Docker or or Nginx <laughs> or that's that. I, I understand that you like something that we showed. 
But here's one thing. Uh, so if you do net stat, uh, I'm just going to do mine. Um, you don't see uh, program names. Hmm. So you don't see which uh, program is actually occupying this one. And for me, that's the most useful one to find. Uh, so what you need to do, you need to add sudo in front, at least right now, yeah. because I'm not running as root. Uh, Docker heart. There you go. So do you know, uh, this is this is one of my fav fav most favorite um, bash commands when I screw something up like this. <laughs> so instead of doing sudo and then typing up netstat, I can just sudo this and that's it. Sudo and double exclamation marks is going to repeat the previous command just with sudo. And now we can actually see uh, all of these things running here. Hmm. No, doesn't okay. work on doesn't work on fish, and that makes me angry. But okay, <laughs> okay. So the difference between I think your um, set of parameters that you're passing, you're also passing U for UDP. Yeah, UDP so you're yeah, actually looking yeah. at for for UDP port as well, and you can see that DNS also runs on UDP port 53, and that's a longer discussion. We, if I remember correctly, DNS is by default UDP 53, yes. but if you get the the size of the response is too big, then it goes over to TCP. Yeah, one of, of one of the interviews questions I had for AWS is why is DNS UDP and not TCP? And I don't still know the answer. <laughs> so, I mean, it's faster. That's the reason. But, you know, we need fast name resolutions. We don't need a three-way handshake for our name resolution, apparently. <laughs> okay. Um, so speaking of DNS resolution, that brings us to my other favorite command, dig. So... so Yes, dig, once again, super, super useful. So you can go dig, uh, for example, let's take my, I've got a blog that's running, I think, on GitHub pages. So if I just dig this, we can see that I get, by default, it'll give me whatever um, the record is configured as. In my case, it's an alias record with two different IPs configured behind it. And this is just for GitHub pages configured. Yeah. Um, but you can do things with, for example, a C name. So let's say, now I've got to remember, I set up a demo running on one of the other domains I have. But, button. Yep, but, buttonmonkey.coza. I just had a thought one day, and like a lot of internet people, I just have too many domains. I think you're missing an N, or this is butto. Is it butto oh, or butto? Button? Oh. oh, button, sorry. There we go. No wonder the frown. Button monkey. Okay. So what I can see over here is that there are actually three IPs, but this is a CNAME record. So if I go tell, tell it to go do a CNAME lookup for me, uh, wait. Sorry, this is it is still an alias record. This is one of those fun things where because it's hosted on a on AWS and we're using the Apex domain, it still is actually using an alias record, not a C name for the Apex. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what this is pointing out at the moment is oh, that's bad me. I didn't have www configured for it. Naughty. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can see here is now that there are three IPs behind it, and that'll actually then rotate between them as you hit the, the or do the DNS lookups. Button monkey. That's interesting. So um, one of the things I, I, I had a discussion with with a friend of mine recently is uh, DNS itself. Now um, this person runs a website. They have they're a developer. They have a website for some company they run, whatnot. And uh, we had a discussion: is should you host your DNS server by yourself? No. No. <laughs> no. 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 So. <laughs> Like, unless you have super specific requirements, legal governance, compliance requirements to have your own DNS servers, don't. That doesn't, like, running a DNS server for just for a single website is such a pain in the ass. Just avoid it oh, completely. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, um, uh, Route 53 is 50 US cents per domain per month, or sorry, yeah, per yeah. zone that you configured. So, I mean, it's j just do that, yeah. It's similar to don't host your own mail server, unless you've got a very, very, very specific need oh, yeah. for it. Mail server hosting has has become so passe, uh, at least in the last you know ten years or five years, let's say. Uh, hosting a mail server is just a, a trouble waiting to happen. Then it says, "Do you, what do you do if you dig X one of those IPs?" Uh, as in dig dash X. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Let's have a look. I actually don't know the X command. I've never had to do that. I like doing this in streams because then people can teach me stuff. Mm. Okay. Oh, it's uh, it's doing the reverse lookup. Yeah, there I believe because that yes, yes. that looks like the EC2 yeah. instance where it's where your button monkey thing is running. Oh, there you go. Uh, yes. Reverse, so yeah. in this case, what did I launch it on? This will be Elastic Beanstalk. 
No, 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 no. This was... Containers? Was it Elastic Bean? It could be Elastic Bean. Look, I've, I've done two demos the last while. The one is with Amplify and a uh, GraphQL backend, and the other one is with uh, Elastic Beanstalk. And I actually can't remember which one was lost. I mean, if it's Amplify, I doubt that this would be an EC2 instance no matter what. So mm. it should be an S3 bucket somehow. Yeah. How does an S3 bucket resolve? That's interesting. Do we get like an IP resolved? Um, oh, uh, let's see quickly. Uh, I have got, what's that bucket called? Uh, I think it's Quibus Cloud. Dot, uh, ooh, let me get it first. I can't remember what the URL is. It's one of those, because I don't use it enough. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Sorry, I'm just jumping on the console in another screen quickly. Uh, here we go. Uh, let's grab this one. It's probably the safest of the ones. Uh, By the way, if chat has any questions, feel free to ask us. I mean, we're, we're completely open today. Whatever questions you may have regarding either with stuff we're talking about or AWS or whatnot, uh, we're super happy to answer. Cool. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Besides you, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis has been banned for questions. Yeah, yeah. Dennis cannot ask, ask questions. He's he's a team member, or at least AWS okay. colleague. There we go. There we go. Finally, have it. Uh, ooh, now I have to copy that. Uh, let's grab it quick. Uh, and where did my screen go? Sorry, I've got three screens in front of me, and it's been a long, fun week. Cool, let's dig this quickly and see what we get out of that. So ah, you get, yeah, so you get an is... S3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get an S3 yeah, endpoint. So... Ooh. Yeah. Is it official, Dennis, now? Can we talk about it? I guess so, right? What is he saying? Oh, you changed the signature. So for those on the stream who don't know why we're joking, is yeah. Dennis is actually joining our team. Yes. Um, but he was already with AWS, I believe. And... Yes, yes. Yep. Dennis, so Dennis, a, Dennis okay. was a Dennis was a solution architect based in Germany, a global solution architect, and since soon, well, since Monday, it's from Monday, he's starting <laughs> with the developer advocate team. So we're gonna be finally teammates. Um, yeah, very good. Welcome to the team, Dennis, and we expect you to stream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come join us and help us here, because obviously yes. we need some help. Yeah. We need um, some help. So that was Dig. Uh, let me quickly just double check here what are the other ones that I want to share. Oh, yeah. So one other one that you probably will run in is that, hey, I'm out of disk space. So DF-H will tell you what drives you have, what mounts you have, and how much space they have and what how much space is used. Um, so super useful to understand at least, you know. We have another person have joining AWS. Uh, Eve, Eve, so Eve Co. Car, if if Trotzar, I'm not sure. Welcome to the team, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, well, a, lot, a lot of Amazonians here on stream. There we go, or future Amazonians. <laughs> um, Dev DevOps consultant, please do reach out to us once you join. Um, um, DFH, yes, the most useful command, especially if you run Cloud9 and you run out of disk space. So. Oh yeah. No, no, it's uh, yeah, and then. Going along with that is a DS dash H, which gives oh no wait sorry DU, DU dash H yeah. yeah gives you a summary of directories in terms of how much space they use. So if you go DH yeah, yeah yeah so over here you can start seeing okay it's this will take a while let me just cancel okay it'll take a while for my command to get through uh, okay there we go so you can actually then figure out where that space is being used to a certain extent um, so nice ways to figure that out. Then the last one I want to show you quickly is a fun one. I had this in an interview with a, another company, uh, they are blue, um, is VMStat. And you tell it that you want to take samples every two seconds and you want 10 of them. And then what it'll do is it'll give you this output. Um, and it gives you an overview of the processes, memory in use, soft space in use, IO in use, which is super useful. And then in terms of the system, how many processes are running, how many context switches there are. And context switches is because your CPU, um, when it changes between different things running, it gives them all a little slice of the CPU time, but it does take time to copy stuff in and out of memory. And that's called a context switch. And the more you have of them, um, the slower your system can become. And I've actually seen a couple of scenarios where there was uh, too many threads were running for the number of CPUs you had. So context switching, I can't remember how many times um, per millisecond, which meant that it spent more time switching than it actually did processing, which is quite amusing. Um, so VM, that... VMstat is one of the tools uh, we used to use back in, when I used to work in support, is that when customers would have performance issues with DC2 instances, one of the things was like, hey, can you do a VMstat? 
with these mm. flags and just can you provide us with the output so we can kind of see where the potential bottleneck is so it's it's a really great way to kind of troubleshoot what could be the problem with the system mm. and a lot of times to be fair especially when people run the t2 instances you, you got just you just get cpu throttle so uh so uh basically when you have like a a, a t2 instance you run out of credits you just get, get throttled so <laughs> Gilagos asks, can you mount an EBS volume from inside of an EC2 instance? Uh, yeah, I see no reason why um, not. You can, you can mount it for sure. If you've got DCLI permissions to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, <laughs> fair point. Yeah. Um, you need wait, wait. CLI or API access with permissions to do so. so. Yeah, that, that's assuming the volume hasn't been added to the instance yet. So, um, but I believe nowadays if you attach a, um, a volume in the console or with API automatically, um, issues it uh, with a mount point. Um, Does it? I, I, I haven't done that in ages, to be fair, uh, but I know in the past it didn't. Well, so in the past you had to so do it yourself. The good news there is we have this thing called the cloud that allows us to do things. <laughs> um, what is this cloud you speak of? This cloud allows me to create uh, an empty volume. Uh, it's going to be a, let's do a 52. Gigabyte one, just so we can differentiate between it. Cool. Uh, I've created it. Uh, let's see where yeah, is it? Den yeah, Den Dennis, Dennis says that you can actually con uh, configure the mount point in the console. So during the mounting, you can actually mount it to the. Uh, you can mount yes. the drive to a to uh, the volume to the mount point already. So that's pretty cool. Okay. So actually, let's do that because I was curious to see this in action. Uh, um, so we can see that it's not there at the moment, uh, and now. Attach, let's hit the attach button. And the console is spinning. It did something and is, do we see a 52 gig? Uh, no, but now we can do- Try LSB, this. Oh, we can LS, uh, LSB, okay. Okay. There we go. We have the NVMe one and one. It didn't mount. There we go. Hmm. See. Um, give it a second, let's double check. But if I go F disk, it said it's gonna mount it on the def uh, SDF. Uh, not mounted, interesting. Um, this is probably where we have to do a reload. Uh, I remember that vaguely a from reload? years ago, having to do it. Uh, let's just double check. Uh, so I'm just clicking on the instance again here in a different window, streaming on the rocks. Uh, yeah, it seems to, oh. It's on SDF, why, uh, not one, just SDF. SDF. Mm. Yeah. So. Interesting. Maybe, I don't know. Like, uh, generally, I remember last time, well, long ago, when we used to instruct customers what to do, they would have to basically create, uh, they would receive the disk on LSBLK, you would be able to see it. Now they have, then you have to manually create a partition because by default, it doesn't have a partition. So maybe only during the instance creation, the entire boot process does that. So I don't know. Mm. Could be. Yeah. Um, but this is one of those things. That it's also like been years since I've done this, to be honest, by hand. I always use automation or infrastructure as code, so I don't have to worry about this kind of thing. Yeah. Mount, mounting mounting volumes on, a, on an EC2 instance is usually, at least in the last four years that I've seen, people use it for troubleshooting purposes or expanding volumes once needed, but hopefully that's not required a lot. Um, what one of the things that would happen is like um you would lose your credentials so that was one of the most common things in my ec2 linux support uh, um, uh, time is you would lose your key then people call us up hey can you get me my key no <laughs> there is no key like we don't have access to it and then basically what happens is they have to take that volume on uh, if they did not encrypt it um, mount it to a different EC2 instance, attach it to a different EC2 instance, and then change like authorized keys or some shit like that. So that was how, how it used to be done on, in support at least. Okay. Actually, I just figured out that the mounting point is this uh, NVMe. NVMe, where... yeah. Yeah. So if we do fdisk slash dev that, then we should... Oh. Sudo. Uh, I want to learn this double, double tick. Yeah. Sudo what? exclamation marks, double exclamation marks. Oh, okay, but it's not going to work now because... It should. Uh, no, uh, because isn't the previous command now the double exclamation command? Ah, okay, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So let's just quickly do this. Uh, cool, and now we can see, here we go. So now obviously we'll create a partition, 
one. Uh, oh, in uh, primary one, this I've done so many times using MDADM. Uh, oh, this is the default, default, uh, P, write it, and cool. And then we should be able to uh, probably uh, mount it. Uh, pseudo, shoot, it's been years since I've done this by hand. Uh, make the <laughs> mount a new drive, and then it is pseudo. MKFS, mount... but you need to make a file system. Yes, uh, so MKFS X4, dot... uh, something. Yeah. Oh, let me try this again. Uh, make fs.ext4, because that's. I used to start with three, I mm -hmm. think, way back in the day, or XFS, depending on what you were doing. Uh, so, this we want to do again to that dev, and that. Have us look at but Yes, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Doesn't matter. It's not a boot partition. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, that's how you would mount it if you want to mount it to run one. Um, once again, like I said, this is now where I'm not showing my age in terms of I used to know this. Um, I still have got a RAID 5 cluster running here. It's been running for oof, probably about three years now. Um, so it's been a while since I've had to do this. Let me try. Uh, uh, NVMe, NV, NVMe, like that. Yeah, but remember, we haven't made a file system yet. Oh, we haven't? MKFS? No, 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 because I couldn't remember the naming convention with these ones, because I know it's SDF1, and in this case it'll be NVMe N1 slash P1? X4 Dev NVMe P1, yeah. Uh, NVMe uh, okay. 1 uh, N Ooh, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you sure? Yes, it's one. It's not good. Okay, there we go. Okay. I, I, I actually I know because the M2 disks that you use on your on your desktop they also show up as NVMe disks. So okay, uh, that's that's how, how how they work. So yeah, and remember when when NVMe disks uh, came out on AWS there was a problem driver issue sometimes. I remember one issue with when we had in support that um, it would keep this detaching disks for some reason it was a it was a shit show yeah but <laughs> luckily it all works right now so <laughs> yeah cool well these are these are some very i have not used these tools gobus in a long time <laughs> like i i use them on my lab desktop but you know um yeah of course when i troubleshoot you know ps PSA, mm. psax and then grep stuff and, and and those things uh but actually let me let me show you some of my um Desktop files. stuff, yeah. Well, not not necessarily mm -hmm. dot files, but uh, uh, some of the things people people ask me like, hey, you know, how do you do your terminal? How do you do your uh, uh, text editor? So um, yeah, there's a few things I've done here. I'm actually going to show it on my laptop because, well, I have it all there. I have not configured it on an EC2 instance, but uh, yeah. So uh, the most common two tools I use in my daily work besides a browser is my terminal, right? Of course, and I use Vim and Tmux, right? So every terminal session I open, it's in Tmux, and that's it. So now, with the things you're looking at right now, I have one, two, three, four, five Tmux windows uh, you can see here on the bottom. Um, and each of those windows, I kind of switch between, right? Um, depending on what I do. And also, Tmux is not just about windows. You can also do tabs. Well, not tabs. Uh, you can do, like, a pane. So I can have multiple things here, you know, uh, multiple stuff um, available like that. You can also have this weird thing like sh uh, showing which one there you can do time well there you go tmux um so tmux is very important and i must say that if i would go where should i go maybe here yeah uh tmux has one more th important thing and that's the t uh, it's the tmux file uh, tmux.conf and this is where basically all of my configurations are now i have all of these things available on github but i have not made them public because they're horrible. I'm ashamed of them. They're bad dot files. They're bad configuration files. Nobody should write configuration files like this um, because but they work. They work. You know, it's kind of a stick, <laughs> stick and rope approach. You know, I need to kind of make things work from time to time. Um, so yeah. Uh, but in essence, I have a very complex Tmux setup. The only complex part of my Tmux is this color scheme or the little uh, arrows and the uh, windows you see on the bottom. That's kind of the the complex complex pretty thing everything else is mostly basic uh, the only thing is i don't use a control b uh button as the as the what i call it the 
what's the name of the the prefix? Yes, I use Control A. It kind of I kind of got used to Control A, so Control A is my prefix. So anything I do is Control A. It's something. So uh, pretty cool. And also, I used to have a fancy title bar before with displaying weather and all those kind of th stuff. But uh, yeah, it 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 it. it proved to be very cumbersome for me to move it around with all the scripts and all the things. So Tmux is basically my default thing. I don't start, uh, <laughs> we can clean up our PR, absolutely, yeah. Uh, the, the problem with my the problem with my GitHub uh, for my um, dot files, actually, let me show you, uh, is I, couldn't, I, I have different dot files for each uh, system I run, for my desktop, for this laptop, and for my MacBook, because they have slightly different things well one of one of them is a macbook so i only have a thing here um uh the other one is my desktop pc which is again a, multiple monitors different resolutions whole lot of things so and the other thing is here and and kobus oh that's a fun command i love that command <laughs> by the way i have a fun command uh where is it uh back here so you know you know when you want to find out which version of a here, please which version of aws you're running so you can do aws version or you want you know when you do the which command and then aws you find where it is i have a command called wtf AWS, and it shows you the version and where it is so <laughs> that is a command or i have a command called where am i and it shows me where which city i'm located in so <laughs> i mean it's not a command it's, it's an alias um that <laughs> just does something uh well it, it curls uh ip config co so curl ip config co um that should actually get me my public ip address i think uh or like this city or it's something else i don't know but yeah <laughs> um but yes your command is definitely a russian roulette so uh hmm. that would be fun <laughs> <laughs> I actually know uh, people who have done that. So the thing you often do is you run this command uh, rm-rf, which is uh, recursively and if for forcing. So it doesn't ask, are you sure? Yeah. Um, and you tend to do it with this uh, rm-rf dot slash. Yes. So you nuke everything in the current directory. And okay. I've seen a couple of people accidentally not put that uh, full stop there. So yeah. I've done I've done it like this. So my first year at amazon uh i it's been like a year and i i had i had my macbook there and i was like okay uh i want to just delete a whole bunch of things i have in my current directory um and i did this i did sudo rm rf dot and then i put a slash but i put a space in between oh yeah and then literally my <laughs> my entire uh well i controlled c out of it but it was too late so it was just yeah bye bye sally um so i lost like two days of, of just having to do that <laughs> there's a worse command let me just control c out of this uh, there's a worse command there's you can do uh i had a, i actually had a t-shirt it said no hop uh sudo rmrf and dash dash no preserve root or something like that yeah so that was like the that and and, and the ampersand at the end so literally you, you cannot kill it but once you run that there's no control c like <laughs> just, oh of course yeah so yeah yeah, so so that was that was a, that was a problematic thing. Uh, okay, so my, my second thing I use, and this is I'm very proud of this um, setup, is my Vim setup. Uh, I'm a big fan of Vim. Now I know that not a lot of people are. Uh, I'm just kidding. They are. They should be. And Vim is a complex tool Ooh. that is. Yeah, I know it's like it's out of war. We, we just lost ten viewers. <laughs> Everybody <Joking>. left. <laughs> Everybody left. So I. I I I started, first of all first time I saw Vim or VI was back in it was not so long ago it was in 2011 11 yes so I, I worked for AT and T back then and um, those systems we used had used list. yeah <laughs> those systems we used had no Bash you can only use Corn Shell and only VI there was no Nano there was nothing. So VI for me was super complex back then because H HJKL movement was for me something like, why would anybody do this? Um, wait, your, your picture went smaller. It's, it's, it's Skype. It's Skype. If you if, if you keep on changing your bandwidth for some reason, it just resizes images. It's oh, okay. Uh, there's no fix in Streamlabs OBS. In regular OBS, you can fix it, but not in Streamlabs. So. Ah, okay. In any case, I hated Vim. I thought it was like, why would anybody do this? People are idiots. This makes no sense. Why would you complicate things when you have nice little arrows on the side? 
No. <laughs> so um, now I am a stern, uh, strong uh, advocate of Vim. Having your keys, having your fingers on HK, HJKLN, it, it constantly makes your makes your life easier. Once you get used to it, once you understand that J and K are up and down, and then H and K are left and right, um, you get used to it, right? Vim versus Nano, like a Nano, I use, but I I use Nano when I accidentally run Nano. It's literally, and then I start using like I open like imagine this, okay? So no. Um, uh, nano, oh, I don't even have nano installed, right? There you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, if I do nano, uh, nano template, I open it but like this and I start doing JK and like, oh, no, 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 wait, wait, <laughs> you cannot do that. And then I don't know how to undo. I'm like, how do how does one undo? It's like, is it control Z? No, it's what? And then, <laughs> uh, then I just, you know, control X out of it and like, you know what? Let me just get in, and um, I should be happy with that, right? So, uh, I, I, I guess. Say my, so, sorry. No, no, I was going to say my Vim usage is I know uh, Shift A to go to the end of the line, uh, DD for deleting a line, YY for copying a line, and PP for pasting a line, and then how to write and quit. Okay. Well, so I'll tell you my biggest adventure with Vim, or or where where Vim saved my time, even though I've I've intentionally chose to spend to waste my time. So. Somebody, I decided to make a serverless application uh, that's going to be an API endpoint that's going to give you out movie titles and descriptions of those movies, right? And I had a big old movie list in a Word document. Ooh. So literally, a, a, I think, 70-page work doc, Word document with just a title, a year of release, and I think a, a description, right? And somebody gave me that. And I'm like, okay, I need to convert this into JSON. So mm. I used Vim to do that. Like with all the macros oh, built wow. in, you can mm. kind of search for specific phrases and then put brackets around. I literally was able to do that in like less than an hour. Otherwise, it would be unless, I, I don't know how else I would do it. Mm. There might be better tools, maybe some big data folks here <laughs> know how to do it. But uh, converting a Word document or, uh, or like in essence, a raw, a raw text document into something useful like JSON, mm. I did it with Vim. And I was super proud of it. I'm like, oh my god, this saved me so much time. I made a stupid API for, for no <laughs> reason, so I didn't save any money or anything there. But yeah, uh, Eve Chotzar says uh, he likes DD and Vim. How do you mean DD and Vim? You mean like running D or ah, deleting a line? Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. So yeah, if you do, um, yeah, quickly you, dropping a line, yeah, yeah, you, you can delete this. Okay. One of the things uh, I, I found, and if you if you ever use Vim, uh, do this, you'll thank me. So Vim, this is not a Vim tutorial, but Vim has three modes, right? It has uh, normal mode, it has insertion mode, and it has visual mode. Now, the normal mode is basically what you see right now. Uh, you see me moving around the document. I cannot enter anything. I'm in the normal mode. Uh, when you're in insert mode, this is where you actually type stuff, right? Um, now... To exit the normal mo uh, from insert mode to normal mode, right? So if, if I want to go back to normal mode, I have to go and hit escape, right? And it will go back to normal mode. Um, the problem is on this laptop I use, F1 is underneath escape. And if you hit F1, you get help. So Ooh. what I did is I've remapped escape or I'm remapped that, not I haven't remapped the key itself, but I've remapped the key mapping so my exit to normal mode is just double JJ. So if I press JJ or down twice in a row, it's gonna exit this. So I will never, well, most of the times I will not write uh, words with two J's next to each other, right? Uh, in my language, there's nothing like that. Or there is actually, oh wait, I have a word like that. But I rate, rarely write anything in Vim in my own <laughs> language. Uh, <laughs> at least I have not done it yet. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a great way to do it. Also, uh, one of the other tools, uh, Cobus, you didn't mention. Uh, these are Linux tools, but I made them work with Vim. So one of the tools, let me actually show you. I will do this. Is Fuzzy Finder or FZF. Now, this will basically look into. Uh, this is a bad example, but if I FZF or let me go to my binary binaries. Uh, no, better music. 
So I have a, I don't have music. Oh, wow. Okay, never mind. No music. Uh, what do I have interesting here to show? Uh, let's go to binaries. So if I want to search files, you can do, you know, find and then name and then blah, right? Or you can do FZF and just type URLs and you have fuzzy finder like this. Uh, you can do fuzzy finder completely in the root of your directory, FZF like this, and it will show all Ooh. the files in your directory. And if I'm looking for a special template, temp, um, template dot, uh, yeah. Oh, this is nice. Uh, YAML, like that. It will show me all the templates that YAML, and I can just arrow into them like so. And yeah, it will give me the. Oh. It will actually give. Now, Fuzzy Finder by itself does not open by default. It just shows. It just throws out the URL or the uh, okay. the, the the path. Then you can bite that path into whatever you want. Right. So, in Vim, if I go uh, to Vim, let's go here. So this is my. These are binaries or. Bins. These are little utilities I've created for myself. So these are, um, if I click, if I run play, it will play music from my laptop. If I uh, if I run rain, it's gonna play ra rain music, or rain sounds in the background. <laughs> it's weird. Um, it's I have the f, f command here, which will just uh, find something. If I do this and just uh, the article, it will find me all the little things. Um, it's it's kind of a faster find command. Uh, but so if I do vim here and I do a space F, it's going to open up Fuzzy Finder, and I can just do play, and it will. Oh, I'm able to open up like this. So having Fuzzy Finder within Vim is so good. So good. Mm. Um, so that's Fuzzy Finder. Fuzzy Finder is a great utility that can help you a lot, uh, and please excuse my horrible uh, files, uh, my horrible shell scripting. So... Um, uh, what else? What else? There is a file called ripgrep. Have you used ripgrep? No. Ripgrep. Uh, ripgrep is a, so basically it's a grep. It's something that's better than grep because ripgrep. So you just rg and then type, let's say I am looking for a file which contains the word ami. And it will immediately in my directory show me all the uh, occurrences of ami. Um, oh, okay. So it grips inside the file. Yes. So if I just rg and then ah. uh, instance like that, it will find me all the all the all the all the occurrences of the word instance in the current mm. directory or anything under the current directory. So I think our rip grep is super great if you want to do something. So uh, this this especially is great if I like uh, I do I have. Uh, let me go to my repository, cdws, repos, and then I have ec2 user data. Okay, so I'm currently in my CDK directory here, and I want to find which library I use that I have uh, user data set up. So if I just uh, rg and then R rg and then user data, it will show me that my file lib has a user data uh, thing on line 33. Yeah, Michael, FZF is great. I just showed FZF as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. FZF searches for all the files within your current directory by the file name, while ripgrep uh, uh, actually searches for uh, contents within the files themselves. So if you do RG mm -hmm. and then, you know, user data, it will find you the file and the line where that thing's contained. So this, this is a really great tool to kind of help me out with, uh, <laughs> with, with searching files, especially if you want to have it complicated like myself. Uh, also, one more thing, Ranger. Ranger, for all of you Vim fans, is a file editor in the th uh, file manager within the terminal. So if you run Ranger, it's a lovely three-pane uh, file editor or file manager which with Vim key movements, which is super extensible. You can do all the things you want here, uh, like so. You know, it shows all the things. You can have uh, multiple tabs of, of this as well, so you can... Uh, tag certain commands or certain key presses to certain commands so uh, if you are in a lot of file management like i do especially when i move files across my network uh, i find this to be very very useful mm. so it's again it's another tool that you need to get used to and learn to use because all of these things have specific commands that you need to run but i've been using doing using this for like four years now and i kind of got used to at least mm. at least a part of it 
And also I think one of the big benefits of using these on your desktop locally is that you always have these available on the servers as well because they yes. are text-based. Exactly. Because that's one of the big things. You don't have VS Code or Atom or Sublime on your server necessarily. Exactly. So I don't even know if I have code here installed. I don't have VS Code. No, I, I don't. I don't have VS Code installed on this laptop at all. So I literally just, for anything I use here, I just use my terminal and the yeah. browser. Now, it's also good if you want to do like, how many, how much RAM am I using? So uh, HTOP, I am using one and a half gigs of RAM and most of that is Firefox, right? So <laughs> no, actually it's, it's brave, but most of that is this. So if I kill this and then go back to this, I, I'm down to 300 megabytes of RAM usage, which I haven't oh, seen wow. since 2006, right? So um, yeah, it's it's a lot less. And actually, so about... I've, I've done this, I've tried to do this experiment. So I have a, I have, where is it? <laughs> I have a Raspberry Pi 3, 3, yes. Uh, so this is a one gigabyte model. Um, it's re well, it's not the newest one, so it's a dual core, I believe. And I've tried to do a whole day's work on the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> uh, so That's gonna be slow. <laughs> it is now. Uh, most of my uh, code editing work works fine, so that is perfectly fine. I can just sit and just bash code easily because nothing changes for me. Literally, just looking at the terminal, nothing changes for me. The only problem is is when I have to use a browser because yes, you can, but should you? Links, links. Link, I, I actually have no problem using links. I, mm. I even use the uh, e-links. E-links is better because e-links actually shows you a really nice uh, outline of the website and you can kind of have a lot of different uh, key combinations when you want to open up some things. That works great. But um, that was the slowest thing. Like, it just takes so much time. Like, my load average was through the roof, right? Five plus on one minute easily if I'm doing anything. Mm. But I'm still going to try to do it. I'm still gonna try to spend a whole day doing um, well work on hit on this. Now I cannot do PowerPoint, obviously. <laughs> I cannot watch YouTube, or can I? Hmm. I have a little command here that does if I do like this. Will I do it? Ooh. It doesn't work. Ah, so I had, I had, I have YouTube, the my command here on YT basically will play um, uh, YouTube DL or it will play. So if I yay S U to DL and MPV. So if I install these parts, these are, these are the things that is missing for my, for my application. So if I do yay and then S and then search for a file call, let's call it reinvent 2019, not, not yay YT. Uh, reinvent 2019. It's gonna find me the first YouTube video from that search, and it's gonna play hopefully in MPV. Yes. So I'm able to run uh, run um, what is it? I'm able to run YouTube videos on much on much shittier systems by running MPV uh, without a browser. Mm. So even now, once I'm doing this, it's it's still a bit iffy. It's not the best thing in the world. A lot of dropped, well, especially with the network now. Uh, but it, but it works, right? So I'm actually able to use this on my on my uh, Raspberry Pi as well. So it it works. So <laughs> it's 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 great. Also, if you want these binaries, these binaries are actually publicly available. I believe I have my bins uh, uh, open on my GitHub page, and I've actually these binaries are uh, available or actually are are not. I have not invented them. I've actually kind of stole them from a lot of places. So I've, I kind of just adopted them for my use. Uh, yeah, it's, it's open. So darko dash uh, slash bin is basically, I have a bunch of uh, binary files or shell scripts that I use for, for cleansing URLs and uh, playing music, uh, uh, opening images as well. And, those kind of things it's 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 weird i have the download uh shell script which just uses <laughs> curl with a bunch of flags nothing special so yeah it's 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 fun just makes life simpler yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so yeah that's uh that's kind of a lot of the tools i've used let me think what else what else uh when we talk about aws specific i want to mention one more thing that's very important because uh i do a lot of 
pod formation, right? So and one of the things you may see is when you go to here and then repose, and then I have a stream. Right. So I have a template here in working example. If I do template YAML, edit, please. So I have a template here that I wrote. It's a super simple template that just launches an EC2 instance and it creates a function that creates a role. So two tools that are useful for me when I do anything cloud formation specific are CFN NAG and CFN Lint. So those tools are kind of tools that can help you analyze your code or statically check your code on your laptop. So if I do CFN uh, NAG and then template, it's going to tell me there's a warning. So CFN NAG will actually look for um, insecure um, insecure patterns in your templates. So it's going to look for some potential insecurities you may have. As you can see here, it's saying me, hey, you know what? Your IAM role should not allow all resources on its permission policies. And mm -hmm. if you have a look at my uh, my actual, uh, this thing, if I go here, edit, please edit. Oh, come on. Uh, if you go here, you will see that I have a resource all like this. Now it will tell me this is not good for my role. So I should probably potentially change it. Mm. Um, another thing, oh, it's not a tool, it's a feature of, of Vim. So do you like writing YAML? It's better than JSON. Uh, but uh, I'll give you that. Uh, I'll, yeah, exactly. But <laughs> what's the biggest problem with YAML? Focus. Uh, no. You don't know what's the biggest problem with YAML? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying if you try and use the um, NO as a value in a list, because it'll interpret that as ah. a false value instead of a string. Yes. There you go. Okay. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, there was a there was a, um, a post somewhere recently where someone decided to shorten a list of country names to use their two-letter ISO code. Mm -hmm. So Norway became no, no, and then everything broke. And then they realized that, yeah, false is not equal to the string NO. Uh, okay. Wow. Fun fun all right yeah. okay yeah so I, I didn't know that but but good to know so one of the things is basically uh, i think dennis said white, white spaces or more precisely uh tab spacing or indentation now i have it on my vim setup that i can see like dots how many spaces do i have which is fine you have like two indentations or three indentations which you're gonna kind of understand how deep you are in your indentations but look here like how can i line up you know, service and, and maybe something else down the line, right? It's, it's, I would I count these dots? Hell no, nah, right? So, copy uh, paste. Co mm, whoo, <laughs> off a website with tab spacing, love that. Uh, no, uh, so I actually have a plugin for, uh, for Vim called, I have no fucking clue, <laughs> something. But if I do this, it shows me this. So I get this lovely uh, pattern of, of, uh, tabs basically um, that show me hey you know what these are the tabs and this is how you can line it up so it makes oh, it nice. much more easier for me to kind of align up my code better in 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 vim now this is not vim exclusive by far uh, uh, visual studio code has this rainbow indentation which does it even better because it has rainbow colors right so it also gives you the ability to kind of more uh, easily indent your code so I think this is very important. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, tooling. Yes, tools. Uh, we, you saw me use CFN Ag, but there's another tool, CFN Lint. Now, CFN Lint, uh, CFN Lint is, as the name says, it's a linter. So it will basically just look at your code and say, it will give you warnings if certain parameters are not used, like in my use case, it's going to scream, hey, parameter key pair is not used. Why did you define it? Right. But it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but what also it will do, it will actually check um, against the CloudFormation spec. So if I open up my template, if I go down and then zoom and then go here, and for example, let's break something. Um, uh, I'm creating a function here, Lambda function, using SAM or serverless transformation, and I'm using uh, the runtime Python 3.7. Let's. Uh, why is it read only? Oh, yes, I know why. Uh, because I have it open here, and I'm going to close it. I'm going to go back to six, and I'm going to go Vim template. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I have a, f a function here, and it's the runtime is Python 3.9. Let's run Python 4. Why not? 
I'm just gonna say runtime Python 4, mm -hmm. save this, um, and then open up my uh, CFN lint again. Uh, where are you? Then do CFN lint template YAML, and it's gonna scream at me, what? That's not a valid runtime. Python 4 doesn't exist. Here are the valid values you can define for your runtimes. And then it's easy for me to kind of change these things up. And do we have Python 2.7 supported still? Well, there we go. Um, so yeah, so now I can just go back and, and fix all of this to 3.7. But one more fun thing about CFN NAG is uh, it's uh, because it checks the spec, it checks the spec per region. So let me do something. Oh, mm -hmm. that's a very interesting thing. Let me show that you. That is useful. So if I go here, does Cape Town has, uh, does Cape Town have T two instances? Uh, no, it doesn't because we got T threes. Exactly. Like so, if I do this now, I save my template and change my default from T three to T two, and if I run my CFN nag, like so, and then dash dash region, AF South. Oh, one. It will scream. Uh, yes, it should be with allowed values within allow. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. That's that's one thing. That's okay. That's fine. That's fine. Let mm. me just do this. But I mean, it's another thing that needs to be fixed in any case. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. Come on. Uh, Oh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for us. South Africa. Interesting. If I... Have you maybe not... Is the tool not using the latest uh, SDK built, uh, built in version? Mm, I don't know. Uh, it used to work with... I, I tried this. Uh, I tried this with uh, you, North, and it used to work. Oh, Dennis, thank you very much for joining. See you next week, man. Uh, and welcome officially mm, to the cheers. team next week. Yeah. Uh, so this used to work. So if you would define something like this but maybe because it's just a parameter uh it, it fails so if i would um mm. hard code something at my instance now in essence what would happen here if i would hard code an instance uh, pr uh, type on my instance instead of doing a ref like so if i would do like that and just do uh, t2 micro save this and go here and then like that it it fails yes you see this it fails right now because it does not support t2 micro within eu north or in the other case uh, mm. af south one because it actually checks would this work against in that region so i think cfn cfn lint is a great tool uh if you if you work with with um cloud formation because it saves you a lot of a trial or error, an error. So before there was a tool such as CFN Lint, I would basically have to go to 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 the web browser and the UI and just upload my template and fingers crossed and does it work or not? <laughs> and yeah, so the parameter oh, will string, I guess. Yeah, that can also be a, the thing as well. So, uh, but yeah, mm. CFN, CFN Lint is if you do cloud formation, uh, I think it's a great tool to to kind of help you help you work with it, and I, I use it quite a lot, like especially when developing stuff locally. So it's it's a it's a great great tool to help you out on that one. Hmm, what else? What else? What do else? I have? AWS Shell or Super AWS? Do you know that? Sauce. Uh, no. Uh, it's ringing a bell now. So wait, no, wait, think... wait until you see it on the on the thing. It's SAWS. SAWS is a interactive shell for AWS. So if I would be doing AWS EC2, that, and then I can do, actually, no, uh, but AWS EC2, and then describe, um, I don't have to type all the commands out because it's kind of it's an advanced shell with all the all the all the parameters it offers me straight from the bath. Oh, here. this is nice. Yeah, so if I do, I think, run state or uh, instance state. Yeah, if I just describe instances, you can do this as well. It will show you all of these things. So it's it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, if I just describe... You can also do um, AWS EC2 instance. Can you do fuzzy? Hmm. Fuzzy should be on, so if you do instances... No, it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually using the CLI role, so it's it's basically using anything I have set locally as 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 my user or the permission model. So it's it's 
it's just a, another layer on, top, layer on top of AWS CLI, which kind of gives you this fresher setup here. It works better or not, so it, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, if you if you want to do a lot of things with 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 um, CLI, and you struggle remembering commands like everybody does, uh, this is a this is a really nice right, nice way to get started. Like, you know, how would you mm. describe a network interface from an AC2 instance, uh, or better yet, how would you connect, I, I haven't shown this tool, but um, systems manager, uh, systems manager, session manager is a feature of systems manager, which allows you to connect to an instance via SSH, even though it's not SSH, uh, through your browser. But if you have CLI and you have the CLI plugin installed, you can also collect, connect through the CLI. So if I do AWS systems um, or SSM actually, so SSM, SSM and then set start session and then instance ID or what's the name of the thing? Is it target? Yes, it's target. And then if I do I, it should show me, hopefully. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't. Ah, uh, no, this is bad. I, I was hoping it would show me all the instances it, it, it can connect to, uh, but yeah. it cannot. No, this I is, think this sucks. it's great that in real time is probably too slow. Yeah, it sucks. Oh, this, never mind, never use this tool, I'm sorry. <laughs> but actually, we can use it. So if I go... Mm. I, I actually ran this before, so if I go to my command here, and if I do AWS SSM... Oh, wait, did I run it? AWS SSM, there we go. Start session and this target, if I run this, it will use the, use the CLI, AWS CLI to connect to an EC2 instance in the cloud using SSH. And I'm using air quotes because it's not SSH. It's literally simulating SSH through port 443. So this is actually all happening through port 443. Oh, and wow. if, yeah, and if I would do sudo netstat, uh, that's that. What is your command? TLNP, right? Yeah. We will see there is port SSA, port 22 running, but if I would PSAX, what is the command that you used? The forest? Oh, this, uh, that's uh, PS uh, AEF double dash forest. There are no SSH sessions at all. So I'm connected here basically through the uh, through the SSM agent installed locally. And this actually even works if your EC2 instance does not have internet access. If you have only endpoints exposed to um, to to like a, 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 a what is it called? Um, the private endpoints? Is it private endpoints? Or basically service uh, endpoints. You can... Uh, VPC. VPC endpoints inside your VPC. Yeah, so you can expose your VPC only to Systems Manager, and that means all the traffic between Systems Manager and your EC2 instance will happen through the AWS backbone, mm -hmm. and thus your instance does not necessarily have to have internet. This one has, so this one, I can think, um, uh, a website, it resolves, but doesn't work, the ping doesn't work. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Trendland asks, do you record the session? Yes, it, mm -hmm. it's going to be recorded. I'm going to put it on, uh, on YouTube later on, so... Uh, Feel free to check it out. <laughs> yeah, I put everything we do on, I record it. It's, it's mm. all public knowledge. It's all a matter of public record, right? So, yeah. Oops. And <laughs> Oops. And there's also, I also <laughs> did I also did a completely separate session on tooling and systems manager. So if you're interested in this, it's all available mm. on that YouTube channel as well. It's, 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 again, it's in a form of a stream. It's not very, it's not very distilled. It's also me rambling about things, but hey, we try to entertain. Not just educate. <laughs> edutainment. So yeah, edutainment. This is edutainment. Uh, late <laughs> night edutainment. Well, well, we've we've been on it for an hour and a half now, and I'm out. Of, I'm out of drinks. So yeah, same. Yeah, but yeah, I think I think this these are all the tools I wanted to show. Uh, these are kind of my like daily driver tools from you know Tmux, Vim, Ranger, Fuzzy Finder, Rip Grab. Well, AWS CLI, absolutely. Uh, CDK. CFN Lint, CFN Nag. Um, what else? I used to use Mutt as a mail client, so I was really, I was really into the command line. Like I was like all, <laughs> I, like, I wanted to not use X11 at all. I was like, I can, can I do everything through the command line? No, that doesn't work. But um, 
you can actually um, uh, do a lot, a lot of things. So I've actually used the uh, terminal email client on my laptop. Uh, like everything is in the terminal. It's 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 great. It's Vim to, to X editor. So yeah. Oh, mm. Trendland. Ah, uh, Trendland is actually writing in Serbian. Hvala uh, lepo. Thank you very much. He says you're amazing today. Where we are. Um, Taking him back to his past or things to his youth. So, uh, okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Next time, if you join, I'm gonna get even an older laptop and do this on a very old laptop if Ooh, you want. <laughs> nice. I have, a, I have a one gigahertz Dell laptop. Single oh, wow. core. That's... Single core. <laughs> Jeep, is that from uh, 2002, 2003, if I think it is? I think it's 2003. Uh, just... Yeah. Come on, come on. Cool. Is there a doorstop? Well, almost. There's no other use, use for it besides being a doorstop or just looking cool. So I've actually used it in one of my streams. So it's a big old Dell laptop with a, with a big old hinge and oh well. the smallest ever touchpad. Uh, <laughs> so, and so the, the 4-3 aspect ratio screens. Yes, oh. the, best, the best aspect ratio. I, have, I don't know why people switch to 16 by 9. I still argue about that, but yes. This one even has a parallel port, so. Oof. And a modem. Oh, And an well. S video out, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've actually done a stream once on, the, on that thing. Um, I've actually streamed from it. It runs at Debian with some old window manager. It was very cool and retro and nothing else, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. But yeah, that's all I I've had got, to say. I've got one more tool that I want to share tonight because Shall it's not I, anything to do with AWS. Shall I it's, switch uh, to the thing? No, no, no. You don't need... This is going to be visual audio only. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that at all, Darko. Uh, yes. It's, can you hear that? Is it quite loud? Yeah, there's an echo, yeah. Oh. oh, is there echo? But is there anything else? Can you at least hear my voice? Yeah, I can hear your voice. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So the, the fun thing that I want to show you, so this is using the NVIDIA RTX um audio thing so what my room actually sounds not like now without that is go ahead uh so let me just check here okay oh wow that's Can loud yeah yeah so first thing i realized is that uh wait let me just quickly go back before more people run away okay <laughs> but it's, it should be better now yeah it's, it's better uh, it's amazing now, yeah yeah so two things. One, the noise cancelling is actually awesome. Two, number two is you can get eight hour long videos of people mowing their lawn on loop on wow. YouTube should you want to. Really? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> wow. Well, actually, I, I have that. I have NVIDIA uh, RTX noise cancelling, um, but I have not been, I have not, I'm not using it right now. Um, but I've tried it out. It's amazing. It's, it's ridiculously amazing. It's sometimes scary amazing how... I've actually, I was demonstrating this to somebody and uh, for that reason, I have a hammer. So I was actually banging a hammer on my desk um, and, and, and trying to do this and literally it would, it would completely cancel out the mm. hammer noise um, um, and you can just hear my voice. So oh, nice. pretty, pretty, it's a pretty little cool, cool tool. Cool. Well, uh, I think yeah. we're going to wrap it up slowly, right? Um, yeah. We've talked a lot uh, about a lot of things today. Um, and Kobus is small again. Let me just switch your video to be a uh, decent size. Uh, we're good now. Uh, yeah, smaller <laughs> as it's Skype with all the things. Um, cool. So, first of all, I would like to thank everybody for joining the stream. I know it's a late evening stream. It's a Friday stream. You might have something better to do, but if you enjoyed <laughs> to bald, bearded, nerds talking about random shit about the cloud and technology and linux and taking you back to a time when you had to actually care about cpu load um <laughs> and mounting disks uh we're, we're happy to be mm. doing this we're gonna do probably some other topic next time or talk about maybe you know what topic would be interesting Kobus? Uh, mm -hmm. and i think everybody would love to hear this is um what went wrong or how much did we screw up or you know oh, war stories Ooh, uh, I think that many. that that would be fun for a lot of people. <laughs> at least that's at least myself as a nerd. I like hearing when people screw up, and um, I like to hear other people's stories. And I would like to hear your stories. And I I, I think I heard a few. So uh, and pe people would maybe like to listen to this as well. So um, oh yeah, we're gonna do this at a, at a semi regular uh, 
basis. We're not sure how often we're going to do this, uh, but we're going to try to keep doing this as, as long as people like it. Um, it's mm. it's fun for us. It's it's literally just um, come here and, and, and banter. Uh, so I hope people keep on joining the stream and viewing the recording. And please do let us know, both of us. You can find our social medias. Uh, well, wait, wait, wait. Um, they are hiding. There. He's not there. There you can find social medias. Yeah. So you can find our social medias anywhere. We're both present. Please let us know if you want us to do cover some specific topic or some something interesting to you. We would really like to. We, we, we're open for that, right? So uh, we're going to keep on drinking every Friday as long as our liver allows it. Um, and yeah, that should be fun. So, um, yeah. Kobus, thank you very much for no, uh, devoting, was a lot your, of fun. devoting your Friday evening to my to, to the audience. And uh, yeah, let's keep on doing it. Uh, I will not say when the next one will be. I'm actually going on vacation next week. So, Ooh, yeah. Definitely only after that, yeah. After that. So once I'm back, I think we're going to do another Friday or some other day. I'm not sure what the people think here think. Is a Friday evening good or do we want to do this? A similar concept without the alcohol uh, at some other point where, where people are mm. more aware. <laughs> so, yeah, please let us know. So, mm. cool. Um, thank you once, once more, everybody. And, yeah, uh, we will see you when we see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, cool. Cheers. Right. Cheers.